This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. My message, Seeking the Face of God. Seeking the Face of God. Psalm 27. Verse 7 and verse 8, Pssalm 27. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou said, saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Verse 8 is my message. Lord, when you said, seek my face, my heart said unto you, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Bless this word, Lord. Anoint it. Open our hearts to receive it, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here in Psalm 27, he prays, Lord, hear when I cry. Have mercy. Answer me. David had one all-consuming prayer. And if you look at verse 4, We find his consuming prayer. There's one desire. Folks, he's looked over his life. and He's he's come down. It's come down to one issue. It's come down to one prayer, one desire. He wraps up his whole life. There's nothing else he wants out of life, out of his future. There's one master desire. Now, that's an amazing thing when a man or a woman can tell you, when you ask them, what's the one goal in your life? What's the one thing you want more than anything else? I ask you that question. What is the one thing that you want out of life? One mission, one pastor in, in Europe told me, he said, would you pray for me? I want to win 10 million souls to Jesus. Well, that's, that's, that's a wonderful thought. But that's not what David had in mind. I don't know what your thought may be. If you could say the one thing, the one desire you have in life that you're going to spend your life, rest of your life seeking to obtain. And here it is in verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. One thing I want. Now, he's not talking about leaving his call, leaving the throne, and moving into the temple, into the house of God. That, that's not what he's talking about. He, there's something spiritual he sees. There's something very deep in his heart. There's a longing. You see, he's not an ascetic. He's not a hermit. He's a warrior. He's an active man. He's a passionate man. He's not just trying to shut everything down in his life. He's going to continue doing what he has been doing. He's going to go out to warfare. And he's been through this. Now, here's a man who's tasted of everything that a man could ever want in his life. Here's a man that's known power, authority, respect. He's known the applause of the multitudes. To him, they sang, David has killed his tens of thousands. Here's, here's a man who had a heart for God. Here's a man whose heart panted after the Lord, a man of prayer, a godly man. And yet there's something missing. There's something he has not obtained. He's facing a host at the time of the, in the 27th Psalm. There's a host that's come against him. A huge host, an army of enemies coming. And they've sworn to eat him up. Those are the very words, to eat him up. I'm going to eat you alive, the enemy said. 
going to consume you. And, and David's not going to God now and his prayer is not, oh, Lord, deliver me from my name. That's not his own prayer. He's saying, I want something now that truly satisfies my soul. I, I want something deeper than I have ever known in the Lord. He, he said, I have one goal now, and that's uninterrupted communion with my Lord. He doesn't want to move into the house. He knows that's impossible. But he knows one thing, that the tabernacle is where the presence of God is. He knows that the house of God is to be called the house of prayer. And he goes into the house of God. And I believe David saw something that just, just did not satisfy his heart. He saw the images. He saw the, the altar. He saw the labor. He saw the sacrifice. He said there's got to be something behind it. And I, I believe with all my heart, <clears throat> David's not afraid of his enemies. He said, I, I will not be afraid. He said, the Lord is my strength. He's a praying man. He knows the Lord is his strength. He's not fearful. But he said, there's something missing. There's something missing. And, and there are millions and millions of godly Christians, those who love the Lord, but they know that there, there is something that there's an inner longing that has not been quite satisfied. There's an unmet spiritual need yet. There's something out there, something deeper. There's a beauty. There's a glory. There's an excitement about who the Lord is that I have not seen that would give me something to see me through the rest of my life. Something I could give my life to that would be my goal, my only ambition, my only agenda boils down to one thing. I want to know what it's like to have uninterrupted communion. I want to be able to call on him at any day. I, I want to be have my life to be a life of prayer. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. In other words, I want to I want to be one who prays constantly. In other words, my life is the prayer itself. He said, "There's something in me. I've known victories. I've prayed about victories. I've prayed about these things. I've seen God's hand. I've been delivered." But in spite of all of my deliverances and these flashes of blessing and anointings, he said, there's something that is not steadfast. There's something I'm longing for, unshakable, uninterrupted. Some kind of a walk with God that I've not yet seen or experienced. And folks, David, I believe... He got tired of dead ritual in the house of God. He tired of the ceremonies. He sees the lamb, but he says, they talk about the lamb. Who is the lamb of God? I want to know this lamb. I want to know what those candlesticks burning mean. What's the fire mean on the altar? What are these things? What's behind that? And David's heart cries out. I believe when he goes to the house of God, and David loved the house of God. And he said, this is death. This is why people are going to the idols, because they don't feel life here. The word of God, the, the priest, come and deliver the word, but it's a dead letter now. It's knowledge, and we've been given this knowledge over and over again. It's knowledge, but there, there is nothing of life to it. The number one complaint I get on our mailing list from hundreds of thousands of people from around the world, my church is dead. One young lady wrote and she said, you can tell when a preacher is praying. You can tell whether you're just getting something that he got from studies rather from his prayer. He said, because even the most biblically strict message can be dry bones if it's not bathed in prayer and the congregation can tell. And I think David felt that, 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 that there's something missing of life. There's something missing of excitement. This is death and that's why I leave the house of God with my soul cast down and I'm saying I've been to church but why is my soul cast down? 
And I believe David made a decision. He said, I've had it. I am not going to live out the rest of my days with these unmet spiritual needs. There's something calling me. There's something out there behind the scene that I have not yet gotten a hold of. And I'm going to make that the goal of my life. One thing I desire and one thing I have set my heart to. And that is that I can dwell in his presence and inquire of him. In other words, I want to know who he is. I want to see his face. So David goes to his own house and he says, I think he's saying, if if the house of God, if the tabernacle of God is the house of prayer, I'm going to make my house a house of prayer. And I'm going to give myself. To seeking him until I find. He does not go to his priest, Abiathar or Zadok. Zadok's a godly man. You see, you're not going to get what I'm talking about to you from your pastors. You're not going to get it from teaching. You're going to get it until you're sick and tired of the ritual of your own life. Going through the same motions, trying to find the depths of Christ. And you have not found it yet because... Somewhere along the line, you got stuck in front of a television set and you neglected your Bible and got dead inside and you turned your own prayer life and everything else into a ritual. And now it's left you hungry. But I'm saying even the godly people who pray, even those who are under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they're always reaching out to this one Eternal, glorious joy, something that will take me to the coming of the Lord and see me all the way through eternity. It's a relationship. It's an uninterrupted intimacy with Jesus Christ. And there's something out there. And just as sure as the Bible says Moses saw his day, the day of Christ, and rejoiced in it. I believe David saw the day of the Messiah and began to yearn after it for a revelation of the face of this great Messiah. So David goes home to pray. And that's where verse 7 comes in. O Lord, hear this cry of mine. Hear my voice. Answer me. Lord, I want to know you. God answers him with three words. David says, have mercy on me. Oh God, there's a hunger in me. There's a God have mercy. I'm so hungry. I have a host of enemies coming against me. I've had so many battles in my life, but oh God, for one time. Lord, open your heart to me. I want to know you. I want to see you. And the Lord answers him with three words. Seek my face. Now, this is not a call to prayer. David's been praying seven times a day. This is not a call. Well, go spend more time. Yes, thank God for more time. Thank God for all the Bible study and all of that. But the face of God is his reflection. It's his likeness. This is a call to get to know who the Lord is so you can live like him. To seek the face of God is to receive the knowledge of who he is, how he acts toward mankind, how he, how his very nature and who he is, so that you can spend your time reaching out, seeking Jesus. Is this the way you would do it? Is this how you would treat? First, you start with your wife, your husband, your friends, and the job. Everywhere, seeking the face of Jesus is not just a call to prayer. It's a call to a hunger and a thirst in the soul to seek in your life a lifestyle that totally reflects who Jesus is. My Bible said he is the express image of the Father. And I thank God. I thank God for that day that God took on a face. You see, David kept crying out, Oh, Lord, show me your face. Why are you hidden? 
Job said, God's hidden his face. And, and one of his advisors said, if God's hid his face, why seek him? And that was the heart of his, of his complaint to Job. And in the Old Testament, it was hard because his face had not been fully revealed. Jesus Christ is the face of God. The express image. The exact. Chiseled. Engraved. As is. Same essence. Same glory. He is God in flesh. And folks, we have the privilege of seeing his face. Of touching him because he took on a face. He took on the image of man. He took on the form of man. He came to feel my pain and your pain. He came to be tempted as you and I are tempted. He came to live as you and I have lived to show that a man can live wholly dependent on the Father. Totally wholly dependent on That he can have an interrupted fellowship. You can live as he did and say, I don't do anything except I see and hear it from my Savior. This is the Christ of Calvary. But today when you hear these words, seek my face, it is taking on now implications beyond any generation we've ever known. When I tell you, I want you to listen closely to what I'm about to share with you. This is a prophetic word, and I want you to get it deep in your soul. I'm saying it again. When God says to this generation, seek my face. In other words, seek to know the real Christ. The implications today are beyond anything history has ever known. Because the question now by multitudes is, which Jesus? Which Jesus? The scripture warns there will come many Christs, deceiving many. Matthew 24, 5. In fact, Jesus said just before he comes, this will be the one great sign that Christ is at the door at the end of all things is about to happen. The disciples asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus said, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. In Matthew 24, 23, he said, they'll say, here's Christ. And there's Christ. And Jesus said, do not believe them. This is not a bunch of crazies running around, dressed in white robes and long beards, saying, I'm the son of God. That's not what he's saying. He's not even talking about men. He's talking about Christ concepts that are coming. Concepts, definitions, explanations of who they believe Jesus is. A Jesus of their own making, of their own imagination. And he said there are going to be many. And they're going to say, no, here's what Christ is like. Here's what Jesus is like. And over here said, no, here's what Jesus is like. Until there is such confusion. In Matthew 13, 22. False Christ and false prophets shall rise to seduce the elect if possible. False Christ will seduce the elect. That, that sentence used to intrigue me. How, how can anybody be deceived by somebody who said, I'm Christ, I'm Christ? They'd be laughed out of church. They'd be laughed out of society. That's not... What it means. The reality is these are concepts. These are going to be this is going to be teachings by false prophets who've transformed themselves into angels of light to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. He's warning about the coming of a new Jesus movement. Educated Men who have left the authority of the scripture, who no longer believe in the power of prayer, 
who have formed their own concepts of a radical Christ, a radical Jesus, that would appeal to young people especially and young ministers. Radicalism. Communion, they talk about. Social justice. All good things. But it's a new gospel, another gospel, and it's all about another Christ. In no uncertain terms, Paul warned us, there will become those who are corrupted from the simplicity of the gospel. There will come false prophets transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Satan himself will be transformed into an angel of light. And his ministers will be transformed into the ministers of righteousness. They will come talking about a new kind of holiness. And that being love your brother, love your sister, do good to the poor. All things that good Christians do anyhow. I want to speak to you about this new movement. It's a new kind of church that is springing up all over the world. They call themselves the Emerging Church. It was in the New York Times. It's been, it's the number one religious thing on internet now. It's being pushed by bloggers. They meet in little groups. And they are those that have claimed that they have mega church burnout. They're burned out from the bigness. They're burned out from the preaching of self-improvement. They came to these churches really as seekers. They came wanting something real. And what they got was a self-improvement message of how to improve your image and reach your physical goals. When all along they said, we went to find reality and we were cheated. One news reporter who walked out of a mega church. Now, when I talk about mega church, we're not, we're not putting, uh, 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 we're not covering the whole mega movement. The, the, this church has thousands of people would probably be called a mega church, but we're talking about those churches. Well, it'll be explained here in what this young man said. He said, we got mega burnout. Most of the young people tired of the shallow gospel of self-fulfillment. They said a Barna Group survey showed that 10 to 12 million born-again Christians, believers, have stopped going to church now. 10 to 12 born-again believers, most of them young people and baby boomers, as they're called. So we were seekers. We wanted a church that was an asylum from iPods and TiVos, Xboxes, competition and bigness. And the church deceived us. It was not a, an asylum that we found from the world, but we found Disney World, a world of skating, sport leagues, cafes, game rooms, the same stuff we were already bored with. You're going to hear more and more about this movement. Folks, in 50 years of ministry, I have seen the winds and waves of doctrine coming and going. Movements that rise. And fall and leave shipwreck everywhere. This is different. All of that was before internet. And before bloggers. And before chat rooms. And before there could be in just one week a false doctrine or doctrine of demons sweep the whole world in just a short time. It's a whole different game. And this will not go away because what we're seeing now is the last attack of the enemy before Jesus comes. Another gospel, another Christ. He's saying, no more, no more crucify him. No more trying to get to reject this Christ of the cross. Let's bring in our own Jesus. Let's dress him up and make him like man acceptable. To anybody. And so now the devil has introduced a new Christ, a new doctrine. And folks, believe me, these ministers that are preaching this are educated people. They are not uh, hippies. They are writing books as theologians. 
and they are interconnected now and there are they meet in little groups. One writer said we were told that all that was all this stuff was meant to attract seekers. But we asked the question attracted to what? Because we search the scriptures and we find nothing in this that resembles the book of Acts. We don't find the book of Acts in church. The truth is most of these that are called seekers are really seeking the face of Christ. They're wanting to know how to live like Jesus. They don't want to live in sin. They, they, there's, there's something about sin that absolutely destroys the fabric of the family. It destroys the conscience. It destroys the meaning of life. And I don't care what kind of house you live in. I don't care if you drive a Mercedes or a, a Rolls Royce. I don't care how much money you have in the bank where there's sin destroying. There can be no joy, no happiness, no peace. And when you come to the end of yourself, you want to go to church. And you don't want a little sermonette. You don't want somebody to tell you how good you are. You want to be convicted of your sins. And that's what this generation is looking for. They're saying, we want to hear pastors that pray. We want to hear pastors that preach Jesus and live the Christ that they preach. We want somebody not trying to get our money, but to get to our hearts. We want to hear from the throne of God. We don't want to hear some man's, some concept of who Jesus is. We want the biblical Christ, the one who shed his blood, the blood-stained hands of a crucified Christ. From Dallas, Texas News, says... These emerging churches weave together elements from different religious traditions, especially Catholicism, Eastern, Eastern Orthodoxy. Some are reviving medieval mystical practices such as walking the labyrinth. In other words, have different stages around the room. Over here you can have a cross uh, uh, in chalk on the floor. You go and write your name on that cross so that... You know your sins are pinned to the cross. You go over here to the candle section and you can light a candle. You go over here and you can just fellowship with somebody. And over here you can take uh, a, a piece of uh, a, a cake and a Pepsi and have communion. That's exactly what New York Times said. Walking the labyrinth. It's a special, and here it says, it's a pick yourself, mix and match approach to the gospel, stressing community and social justice. Hell is rejected because it makes God look like a torturer. So now there are images, candles, incense. We are trying to get, here's what they say, we're trying to get reconnected to Jesus The radical Jesus. They say we want to put a more humane face on Christ, on Jesus. I want you to go with me to Galatians, the first chapter, the first chapter of Galatians in your Bible, please. I want to show you what Paul the Apostle says. If there's any other Christ other than Paul preached... He's a fake. First chapter of Galatians. Sorry, verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Beloved, those days have come. How do we know that Jesus is coming? Because he said just before he comes, many Christ, many gospels will appear. Which is not another gospel. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. 
If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not from man. And I didn't receive it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is a revelation. And now they're saying, let us reason together and let us see if we define. In fact, one of the top leaders of this new emerging church movement has said, clarity is good, but intrigue is better. Intrigue. Think about that for just a moment. Intrigue is subterfuge. It's clandestine effort to impress or to influence. Clandestine effort. He said, they, they said clarity. Folks, the very foundation of the knowledge of Christ, the very foundation of the Word of God is clarity. Simple. They're being removed from the simplicity, the clarity of the gospel. Moving into intrigue in what they're saying. Let us get together and find out behind the message what Jesus really meant. In other words, they're putting their own face on the face of Christ. The Bible said they made him a man like unto themselves. So now it is... You can worship with the Buddhists, you can worship with the Islamic, because Jesus is love. That's where it's headed. You say, Brother Dave, I didn't know anything about this. Well, you're going to hear more and more about it. And God is always on time. But they, the very words, the very foundation, and I, I get this right from their writings Everything now is negotiable. In other words, take a look at the whole gospel. Let's redefine it. Let's look at Jesus and redefine who he is. Now, I've got a warning for every young pastor that may be here, every young person that's in the Internet, and you like to surf the Internet, and you want to, you've got a hungry heart, and so you're searching, and you're going to bookstores, and you're picking up books by these writers about the new brands of Christianity, new definitions of Jesus Christ. And it's very intriguing, very well written, very seductive. But I'm telling you, the bait, the bait is Jesus, a radical Jesus who will be against war, a radical Jesus that's going to bring down the establishment, a radical Jesus that will wipe out poverty. Folks, are we know what Jesus Christ is in all of those human matters. We know our meek Savior who loved the poor. And you know the love that Christ gives to his body for the widows and the orphans and all. But you see, along with that radicalism, this neo-radicalism, there, there's something deeper than that. And it all goes to the divinity of Jesus Christ to bring Jesus down. And you see, it's no more a mirror. See, the Word of God is a mirror that shows you Christ. And so that you can reflect that image to the world. You don't mar that image. The world is not to see you, they're to see the reflection of Christ through you and through me. But now you see, I define Jesus, and it's not a mirror, it's a painting now. I can paint his face. I can describe him. He looks just like me. He, he, he is what I believe he is. He's what I think he is. So everybody's got their paintbrush and everybody's got their canvas. And this blogger over here says, no, we have found a new way to bring Jesus in. And no, it said, well, we've added this. And so now, and they call it, their very words, it's a little messy. But you have to have messiness. You have to have intrigue. Folks, this is an attack on the, the absolute godness of Jesus Christ. 
to make him a man. This is where the Islamics are going. I've been warning for years, now 10 years, about the new world church order that's coming. And I've wondered how could, how could you get denominations to come in to a world church coming out of Europe, coming out of Brussels. A church that has all power and all authority who can jail anyone else who will not go with them. They're already doing that in some countries where a pastor speaks about homosexuality from his pulpit. It's happened in Sweden. It's happening in other countries now. One world church. And how will all the denominations come in? How will the Catholic church come in? How will the Protestant? How would charismatics come into that? Because many of these in this movement come from a charismatic background. How could anybody, because the mantra, the hook is Jesus. Not Jesus God, not Jesus Christ, but Jesus, a prophet of man. And folks, this is why the cry goes out from the heart of God. Seek my face. I have to have a people who so reflect me that the world doesn't have to go to a book. They don't have to go to the Internet. They don't have to go somewhere else but to their neighbor. They go to you. They go to me and they say, I know where Christ is. I know what his face is like. I know a man. I know a woman wholly dependent on him who walk and talk like him. We have to be the face of Jesus Christ to a lost world that's mixed up and confused. So we go to this word. That's why it's important. This, the church has gotten so far away. They go to some churches now and they, all it is is prophecy. Prophets. And this is in Pentecostal movements. And this is, this is even worse. Because they equate prophecy with the same authority as the word of God. They say if he's a true prophet, his word is equal to the scripture. Can you imagine how men can dominate people's lives under that concept? <clears throat> now, this emerging church, they call it the emerging church. Paul, the apostle. If he stood where I stood this morning, would stand up here and cry at the top of his voice. Even if an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed, the scripture says. Well, what's God's answer to all of this? How do we react as lovers of this blood-stained Christ? It is this very thing. Seek my face. You will not find his face anywhere else right here. You will not. You see, to David says, oh, one desire. And, and that's, that's, where, that's where I've come to. Thank God for family. Thank God for ministry. Thank God for 50 years of ministry. But folks, it's boiled down to one issue. One desire. It's more than wanting to be loved and appreciated for the cheers and praises of man. It's more than being comfortable and knowing that you're secure in your old age. And you've got some retirement plan. Or something. It that means nothing. It comes down to this one issue. I want to be like Jesus. I want to see his face. Then I want to be a reflection of who he is. That's all of our missionary work. All, you know, people say, oh, the issue is soul winning. The issue of missions. The issue is reaching the world. But if you don't know his face, it's all in vain. How do you influence people? How do you reach the conscience of men? Unless you have seen his face, you know who he is, and you reflect him. 
Seek his reflection. That's the answer. I, I, this past week, I was in my office, and I just raised my hand. Oh, God, look what they're doing to my Jesus. And the Holy Spirit said, don't worry, David. Don't be afraid. You know how it's going to end. And I turned to Revelation. <laughs> Will you you stand while I read this to you? Will you stand for just a minute and let me give you? I'll I'll just wrap it up here right now. He said, don't despair. You know what's going, how it's going to end. The heavens are going to open and behold the king of kings and the Lord of lords on a white horse. He's coming to rule with the rod of iron. He's going to hold, he's going to bring down and lay down every false prophet. He's going to smite with his sword. All that is of Antichrist, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Raise your hands and praise Him. You know the real Jesus. We know the real Christ. Come on, folks, lift your hands and praise Him in the annex and in the overflow room. The Christ of the cross. The Christ of the shed blood. The Redeemer who came to redeem us from our sins. Oh, God, that we could reflect your Son to this world. That we would have this uninterrupted love and relationship with Christ in a troubled, teeming world. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you know he's here? The presence of Jesus is here. Just let me add one thought. Let me tell you where I really saw Jesus reflected. Last week I was in Los Angeles. I think I told one of the services. I don't know if it was a Sunday morning or not. Was it a Sunday morning? Yeah, I, I told you about going to Los Angeles. Sonny Argonzoni was a drug addict. First drug addict won through Teen Challenge here in New York years ago. Now he's a bishop of over 500 churches and outreaches to drug addicts in the inner cities around the world. I preached to 16,000 converted drug addicts and alcoholics. And I saw, I saw a choir of between four and 500 women, all dressed alike. And it took a half an hour for them just to march to the stage, a huge stage in the Civic Auditorium. And I saw four to 500 converted prostitutes, prostitutes, and drug addicts singing, I am free, I am free. That was the reflection of Christ. That was the face of Jesus. Seek my face. Reflection, who he is. Lord, speak to our hearts now. Let that be the one ambition, the one desire, the only consuming desire. Lord, show me how to be like you. Show me. I'll seek it. I will examine my heart through your word. And I will seek your name and who you are that I can live it, that the whole world could see a church where they could come and feel and know and experience the presence of Christ, where the Holy Ghost can interrupt at any time and do what he chooses. Thank you, Lord. I I don't know how to give an invitation today. If you're here this morning and you've your, your heart has drifted Away from Jesus Christ. Or you came in here, burdened. Maybe you don't really know him. Well, this is the chance to get to really know him. To draw near to him. To step out and make a declaration 
I'm not where I should be. I'm not what I want to be. I am not the true reflection of Jesus Christ. There are things in my life that hinder the reflection of Christ. If you want that right, made right, you can step out of your seat. Here in the main auditorium, go to the, in the balcony, go to either stairs on either side. And here in the main auditorium, just step out of your seat. This we call the altar area. It's just the front of the church where you can come and join us. We'll pray with you and for you. And, and believe that the Lord will meet your need today. Don't walk out if there's an unmet spiritual need. He can meet that need. Especially for those that say, oh, Pastor Dave, I, there's, there's something missing in my life. There's something missing. And in the annex, we, we'll, I think we'll have room. We'll invite you two to come. Just go, turn around, go to the lobby. And the ushers will show you how to get into this room. You can walk down the stairs and come and meet me right here at the front. We'll believe the Lord Jesus to do something of a change in your life, supernatural work of his Holy Spirit. Step out of your seat. Come only as the Spirit draws you, please. In light of what I said, go back to what the apostle said. Lord, when, in, when are you coming? When does this all wrap up? When is the end coming? And immediately... Jesus doesn't talk about immediately about wars and rumors of wars and all these things. His main issue was you're going to there's something going to happen about my name. There's something going to happen. Many are going to come saying he's here, he's there. He's talking about this these incredible uh, images of who Christ is. I'm going to ask the Lord right now to make sure that the image that's in your heart and mine is not a wrong image. If you have an image of Jesus that says, well, God, like one pastor said publicly, he knows who I am and he knows my passions, so he endures it. In so many words, he puts up with it. No, that's not the real Christ. The real Christ so loves you, he will not let you persist in sin to destroy yourself. The real Christ will bring you to an altar like this. The true Jesus will say to your heart, I can set you free. And I can give you something that satisfies you, not just here in church. Because I think that's what David was thinking. David, God, he had to say, Lord, this has to be more than just a Sabbath experience. I, I want this when I'm out in a battlefield. I, I want this sense of your presence. And Jesus wants to go with you. He wants to cleanse you by his spirit. He wants you to know full fellowship. Do you know you can talk to Jesus all day long? Did you hear me? You can fellowship with him all day. I do that, but I also have a secret closet where I go. I, I find time. Jesus, the, one of the busiest men on earth, made the time. You, you find the time. To, to do it on the subway. Do it wherever you can. Bow your head and just talk to Jesus. But more than most of all, don't depend on the tapes. You can get them, but you better get this open. You get this in your heart and in your soul. Will you... Pray this prayer with me, please. Lord Jesus, I step forward because I'm hungry and I'm thirsty to know you more, to get more of you, to live like you. Would you cleanse me, Jesus? Go deep in my heart. Show me where I need to change. Help me with my temper. Help me with how I treat people. Let the likeness of Jesus be a light shining out of me. Cleanse me. Lay hold of my heart. I surrender it to you. I have something in me like David that hungers, that says there's more. And I want more. And by faith. I'm going to set my heart to get it.
Raise your hands and thank him right now. Just thank him. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for hearing our cry. This is the conclusion of the message. This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. Second chapter of Hebrews, first few verses, one through three. Now, folks, I can't take this out of my Bible. It's in your Bible, and we face it lovingly. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, as at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it, God also bearing them witnesses, both with signs and wonders, with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, according to his own will. In verse 3, I want to focus on how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. These words came directly from Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray for mercy and wisdom, for unction, for strength, for anointing. Lord, this is a message you spoke to me personally, that this had to be something that I see, something that I lay on my desk and read from the the rest of my life, that I will turn to this and remind myself and remember the loving warnings of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we rejoice in your promises. We rejoice in the security of our salvation. We rejoice in these things, but we also accept Through grace, we accept the loving reminders and warnings of the Holy Spirit. Lord, how faithful. What a wonderful act of mercy and grace that you would come to us and just show us out of your grace and out of your love and mercy. You would just say, look at this. Remember this. Here's what I have to say to you because I love you. Lord, speak through love this morning, we pray. But Lord, let us not bypass the tremendous things that God wants to reveal to us by his word and by his spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, as you know, the last four or five years, I've traveled all over the world. And I observe and I watch and I listen. And and in the past four years especially, I've seen a spiritual evil tsunami, so to speak. I've seen waves of apathy come to sweep over the church of Jesus Christ. I saw it in Sweden. I prophesied about it. I've seen it in Australia. I've seen it in New Zealand. I've seen it in the United States. We we see entire denominations drifting away from the truth of their founding fathers. The, The church that I grew up in, the denomination that I grew up in, a Pentecostal denomination, such great prayer warriors who are always thinking about the coming of the Lord, preaching about the coming of Christ. And there wasn't much money. There wasn't a lot of prosperity, but there was such a hunger and such a thirst. And even as a child, I would go to these meetings and be stricken by the Holy Spirit and such power. I was called to preach at the age of eight in one of those meetings where the Spirit of God would so fill the house. Now, folks, we have that here at Times Square Church, and we thank God for it. There are other churches all over the United States that have what we enjoy here. We're not the only one enjoying the sweet presence of Christ and the moving of the Holy Spirit. But, folks, there's something happening all over the world. There is a spirit of apathy. There's a drifting away from Christ, from the 
desire for the Shekinah glory, the desire for the nearness of Jesus. I, 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 a few times that I have not been in this pulpit and have traveled and had a Sunday off and I, I go and I'm hungry. I've done that in three or four occasions in the last two years. And I go so hungry and I said, so I want to I want to see I want to hear something from the Lord. And I've watched them, them, them coming in to the meetings with such sloth. Uh, with their cokes in hand and their Danish and all through the preaching, drinking their cokes and eating their Danish and such irreverence. And then I watch and listen to a 15, 20 minute little lecture about uh, how to to prosper on your job, how to raise your children, which is fine. And we need all these principles and thank God for it. But then at 12 sharp, we we watch them run to their cars and it's a race to get out of the parking lot. And folks, we have warnings all through the Bible that it's possible for those who are, who are at present near to the Lord, those who yearn and hunger for him, that it's possible to drift. It's possible to neglect this great salvation. You'll find these Bible warnings to devoted people. This, this passage I just read to you was not written to sinners. It was written to devoted men and women of God, to the true church of Jesus Christ. From the heart of Christ himself. How shall we escape if we, we God's people, if you, David Wilkerson, who testifies that it was through prayer and devotion to the Lord that you received a call at an early age. You who fast and pray and seek God. You who have been used of God in, in a measure. How will you escape if you neglect this great work that God has done, if you drift away from what God has laid on your heart and the obligations and the personal responsibilities to maintain the fire of the Holy Spirit in the soul. These are powerful warnings from the scripture. Awake thou that sleepest. These are in the word. The scripture says it's high time to wake out of sleep. For now our salvation has come nearer than when we first believed. Paul the Apostle warns, and this was right after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Some have become wanton against Christ. Some are already turned aside after Satan. But this morning, my concern is not the drifting in the church of Jesus Christ or the, or the backslidden church. I'm not focused on the apathy that I've seen and heard by pastors who come to me like the one pastor said, I, and in fact, I can read that he said, in the last few years, I've never seen the level of trouble, discouragement, relationship problems, financial stress. The more I prayed and sought God about these problems in the church, the more they increased. I came to a place of just quitting the ministry. I'll never leave Christ, but things are so difficult now. We get by emails, we get them by letters from all over the world, the, the same thing. There's, there's, a, there's a tremendous falling away from, I, I know missionaries who spent years on the mission field, marvelously used. I remember one missionary couple had communion every day, husband and wife, a powerful testimony in, in their latter day. He died, she came home, and I watched and heard of that one woman who was one of the spiritual missing heroes of mine just sit in front of a television and waste her spiritual life and become absolutely dead until her grandson knelt by her chair and said, I'm, you were my hero, I was going to serve Christ, but if this is how you end up, if this is how the fire dies, I want nothing with your Jesus. I want nothing to do with it. And he backslid and went to college. You see... None of us. If you sit here this morning thinking, I could never drift. I could never neglect this great salvation. Scripture says, take heed when you think you stand. Lest you fall. It doesn't mean from your salvation, but it means, I'm not saying that isn't possible, but I'm saying that the fall away from steadfastness is what Paul is speaking on. He himself had a concern. Now, you can interpret this any way you want. But Paul said, I bring my body under. 
lest under any account or in some way, after having preached to others, I myself to become a castaway. He's not talking about losing his salvation. Paul's never had a thought of that. But he, he is saying, there's some, it's, he's entertaining in his mind a possibility that he could lose this fire, this vision, that in the end he would just peter out, he, he would just inflame out. Not going to hell, but not having, not being useful in the service of God, not being fruitful. Paul's life was all about bearing fruit. It was about having the life of Christ pouring into other lives. And he dreaded the very thought, the very thought that I, I'm going to keep my body under. I'm going to lay hold of the promises of God and trust the Holy Spirit. The one who's called me will keep me by his grace. Now, I'm secure in my salvation, but I take heed to these godly men. <clears throat> there's a law of the <clears throat> nat- there's a law of nature that interprets the law of the spirit. I'll say that one more time. There's a law of nature that interprets the law of the spirit. Jesus, or the scripture says, I think in Romans first chapter, speaking about those who claim they haven't heard about God. And in that chapter, he's talking about homosexuality. And he said that which could be known of God was clearly manifested to them through the things that are seen or created. And if, if you remember all through the scripture, what did Jesus say? Uh, remember the ravens, consider the birds, can, uh, all of these considerations that Jesus mentions. He, the scripture, Paul talking about remember the oxen that treaded out the corn. And he, he said, go to the ant thou sluggard in the Old Testament. In other words, look at nature. See how nature illustrates spiritual lessons. Let me give you an example how the law of nature interprets the law of the Holy of the Spirit. I I was reading uh, a Christian biologist in the last few weeks, uh, written probably 150 years ago, and he was talking about a fish that's in the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky. And there's a great underground lake in that. It's 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 pitch dark down there, of course, except the, the <coughs> electricity where they take uh, shines for take the tour groups through it. But there's a fish that is living in that that has evolved over the years. It, at first, it was a, a multicolored fish and uh, had good eyes. But over time, preferring darkness rather than the light, something happened. The fish turned blanched white and a biologist took one of those fish out of Mammoth Cave Lake and dissected the eyes there in this white head. There are two black eyes look like perfect eyes. But when they're dissected, they prove to be fake. The, the optic nerve died and all of the sight was taken from it. Nature accommodated through a lack of exercise because there was no need because of the preference for darkness rather than light. This fish lost its vision. And goes about the lake freely, bumping into objects. And uh, the total nerve system did. There's just a thin piece of thread left that once was light, which was alive. That explains something of the Holy of the Spirit of the Living God, and how the Holy Spirit is. There's a law. What you don't use, you'll lose. What you don't lose, you're going to use. And the Bible makes it clear. Neglect causes deterioration. Neglect the gift of God. Neglect prayer. That can, I know that can happen to me. It can happen to anyone who, who, who comes to church and has only auditorium religion. We have, we have masses who have just auditorium religion come to church and want to suck the life out of those meetings and get enough to see them through. You have to have a personal experience, your own prayer life, your own walk with God in this world. You have to have it. You can't get it just in the auditorium. You have to be exercising the faculties of faith. You have to be exercising your spiritual arms and your legs. In Psalms, I'll just read it to you, Psalm 55. You see, there are a lot of people that 
drift away from Christ because they're simply weary of the struggle, weary of the battle of life. And, and it's not that they're giving up on Christ, but they're giving up on the struggle. They can't handle it anymore. Some people are just plain tired. They are tired of the trouble, tired of the financial stress. They are weary. They are worn out. And they want to escape. They don't want to be so intense for Christ. I hear it from, the, I just read it to you from a pastor who said, the more I prayed, the more trouble I saw. Yes. And we can't promise you from the word anything other than that. Nor could Paul the apostle, nor could Christ himself. He said, we're going to suffer just as he suffered. But it's in that struggle we meet Christ. It's in that struggle we become strong. Christ meets you in the fiery furnace. He meets you in the lion's den. He meets you in the sinking boat. He meets you in the storm. He meets you in the hard place. That's where the revelation of Christ is. But you see, we get tired of the struggle. We say, who needs it? I don't need this. Look around. All those around me, they don't struggle. They, they, they seem to be able to just flow through their Christian life and their Christian walk. Everything seems to be fine. Their bills are paid. They're happy. And everybody's smiling. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to knock that. I'm not going to try to explain it. But I'll tell you, if you're going to seek the face of God and you're going to be avid in this word, you're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. And it's going to be that way. So settle in. And know that you may not see the strength, but you are growing. You are growing wings to fly over. And the Lord's going to come skipping over the mountains, the Bible said. From mountain to mountain, come skipping. David was that way. You remember what he said. My heart is sore pained in me. The terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me. Horror has overwhelmed me. And I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I'd fly away and be at rest. Lo, I'd wander far off, and I'd stay in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from this storm. Yeah, I want to get away. I I make an easier way. I, I, I can't handle it anymore. Who needs it? You see, the Bible, let me put it, the church is in a perfect storm. This is the perfect storm. Never in history has there been such when they call perfect storm where everything is affected in our life. Every single thing. Let me, let me tell you the danger of wanting to escape and take the easy path. Folks, that's a very dangerous place to be where you may not say it, but... The thoughts are in your, planted in your heart, your mind. Why be so intense? Because I, I go from one trouble to another, and there's some of you here are in it over your head. You are, you have never been so tested. You, it's beyond your comprehension, and you're just staggered. You, you are absolutely staggered. Say, what's going on? And, Deep in your heart, you love Christ. But you say, why go on like this? I don't get an answer. I am struggling like I've never struggled before. You see, even in your struggle, you, you have to. You have to go for the resources you have. There has to be fertilizer, so to speak. Let, let, me, let me just put it from my heart. In this time of testing, we have a tendency to hide from the Lord. We have a tendency to leave our prayer closet. We have, we have a tendency to just, to just go in, inward, look inward and say, this is enough. Maybe just sit in front of a television set and, and just go numb. Just, just go numb. And so we have a tendency, and then it goes day after day and week after week, and living in this discouragement, not really resting and trusting in the work of God, that he, he is going to bring you through. Beloved, if that were not true, this is all in vain. We might well shut the doors of this church and turn it into a bar. 
God has promised that there'll be a time that you come out of this. God said that he's going to be with you. And you've got to hold steady and you've got to fight the struggles there, but you've got to fight by faith. You can't let up on the fight of faith. It's easy for me to just stand here in the flesh and say, hold on, hold on, but I've been there. And I can say after over 54 years of preaching now, and I can say I, the Lord has shown me many troubles and many sorrows and heartaches, but he's brought me through. And that's what God will do for you. There are still struggles and there's still pain, but I know that I'm gaining strength and I know something's happening in my life every time I struggle through by faith. And rest in his promises. I don't know who I'm speaking to. In Proverbs, the 24th chapter, it's a word by Solomon. He said, I went out to the field of the slothful. He's talking about a man who's given up. He doesn't want. He, he, he's just neglecting his vineyard. I went out in the field of the slothful. And by the vineyard of the man, void of understanding. And lo, all was grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall was broken down. Then I saw it, and I considered it well. I looked upon it, and I received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall your poverty come as one that traveleth, and I want as an armed man. Solomon said, I saw in nature something that taught me in my spirit. Nature illustrates the law of the spirit, the law of nature. And the law of nature is if you don't water your garden, you can go to any suburb around here and look at the, there'll be lawn after lawn, well manicured, watered trees, plants, green grass. And on weekends you see both husband and wife out there trimming and planting and fertilizing. There's a reason why it's green. That's the reason why life is flowing. Because it's being ministered to, it's being cared for. It's not being robbed of, of the, the resources that are, that are needed. But then, then you come to one that's all overgrown and it, it, there's, the lawns are dry and brown and everything is dying. And it screams at you, sloth. It screams at you, somebody's in there lazy, somebody's not really keeping up life. And it's what Solomon said, he said, I saw that and I considered it well, and I looked upon it and I received instruction. I told you about a little tree I planted last year. I preached about it from the pulpit. Little stump that looked dead. No fruit, nothing. Just a, a little thing. I planted it. I don't know why, I just felt sorry for it. Planted it. And I knelt by it and I prayed, Lord, let there be life. Now, if I just planted it and just left it there and said, well, the sun, sun, all the nutrients are in the sun. It also needs water. But it not only needs water, it needs fertilizer. So I began to go out there every day with a sprinkling can full, about a five-gallon can of water. And I, I watched... The, the leaves began to grow on it, and I, I watched life come. But then after, if I would ignore it for two days, I'd go out and the leaves were drooping. So I would go get my sprinkling can, but this time I added a spoonful of miracle Grow. <laughs> Every time I went out, miracle Grow, miracle Grow. Folks, I'm telling you, this is the biggest miracle Grow on the face of the earth. This is miracle Grow. How do we expect to maintain the fire? How do we expect if we don't give diligence? Let me give you another illustration from the law of nature. It shows the ruinous consequences. How shall we escape? The Bible said he's talking about the consequences of neglect. If we neglect spiritual warfare, if we just say, hey, I'm going to find a nice, easy place where there are no people. Most of our problems are people problems. 
You say minor money problems. Well, it's, it, it, it's still this is what I, I think many of us say, if I could just get away someplace quiet. You know, as one preacher from this pulpit preached, preach, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> because here's an illustration from the law of nature. The ruinous consequences of quitting and drifting, lack of faith. This biologist did a study on the life of a crab. The crab, a crustacean, and <clears throat> the crab life is a very different. Please excuse us, but when I read this, I said, that, that's, there's a sermon in that. If the law of nature illustrates the law of the spirit, I want to learn from this. And I learned, and I'll never forget it. And maybe this is one way you won't forget what I'm saying. But the, the crab lives a, a terrible life. It's, it's bounced over the jagged rocks and, and <clears throat> the bottom of the sea. They're, when the waves just toss them about, they live a very jagged, rugged life. And for many, many years, that's how they developed this strong shell and these five pair of legs grew meaty and strong to resist the tide. And they learned to hide under rock formations from their predators. Nature can't explain it. The biologist said that the species, a certain number of those species, decided to take the easy route. They were tired of the struggle, and so they took to making a home in abandoned shells of mollusks and other animals that left their shells. I, I saw one, in fact, they call it the hermit crab, and I saw one crab in Florida that was in a shell that was 8 to 10 inches big, great big horn shell. They call it the hermit crab. Now, the hermit crab, <clears throat> somehow, a number of that species decided to quit the battle, and they go in with their measure of health, their, their meaty legs and their, <clears throat> their shell. It's like an armored shell. And they go into this secondhand house and they settle in. And there's a little, the biologist said, a little tube-like item that sucks to the wall so it is safe. In other words, it tra- because it didn't want to struggle, it gave up the struggle for safety. Like many of us want to give up the struggle and find a safe house, a borrowed house if necessary. It's like a daughter plant, D-O-D-D-E-R, that comes and springs up and, and it has a measure of life and gets so high that it's got a, twi- a, a, a limb that goes over to the next healthy plant, put a suction cup and sucks the life out of that and begins to, loses its life and crawls around the ground until it dies. But this hermit crab goes in and there's a high price for going after safety and losing the struggle and wanting only to get to heaven. Don't want to battle. Don't want to fight anymore. No spiritual warfare. Just give up and just hang on. I'm just going to love Jesus. I'm not going to hurt anybody. I just want to be by myself. I want to get rid of this struggle. And so that terrible price, they begin, the legs begin to wither. The back begins to come paper thin. And after a season, the legs begin to fall off one after another until there's nothing but a shell. And that little hermit crabs becomes a weak, useless little creature until it finally dies in its safe place. Folks, while the other crabs are out swimming and in the free air, and yes, there are predators, we fight against principalities and powers of darkness. We have predators. And the winds and the waves toss us and there are jagged rocks. But there's only one rock. There's only one safe place. I want to be one of those who fights. I want to be one who's swimming free. I want to be one of those. I'm not going to call you a hermit crab if you are drifting. And I'm not trying to be facetious, but folks, get the thought in your mind. Just like Solomon said, I saw it and I perceived and I learned from it. Now, let me get to the heart of this. When I prayed, Lord, how, how do I keep from drifting uh, how, how do I keep from neglecting this great salvation? I've never once doubted my salvation. 
But I, I, I know what can happen because I've seen the shipwreck all around. And so is Paul when he writes about it. But when I ask the Holy Spirit, how, how do I guard against neglect and drifting? And he led me to the life of Peter. You, you know well the story of Peter. And what I'm, what I'm going to tell you now, it's not enough to just fast and pray and read your Bible. The Lord takes that for granted that Peter, who's now repentant, he, nobody drifted further among the disciples. Judas, of course, betrayed him. But among the other eleven, Peter really drifted from Christ. He said, I don't even know the man. And he cursed. The Bible says he went out and repented. It was pride. It was self-boasting. And he even said out loud these thoughts he gave voice to. Others may leave you, but there's no possibility that I could drift. Somebody may be thinking, Pastor Dave, why, why would you preach about the possibility uh, of somebody drifting away from the vision and fullness of Christ? I, I believe that this is the attitude of Peter, that I can't fall. Others may fall, but I have reached a place in Christ in my faith that I don't have to be warned. It was this pride. And so, Peter, I want you to notice this now. He's in a boat because he said, I'm going fishing. What he means, I'm going back to my career. I don't want this struggle. I, I don't have it in me. And you take a look at that man in the boat. And you look at that man at pulling in the hall of fishes. Here's a man who is repentant. Here's a man who is prayed. Here's a man who's been restored. Here's a man who's been breathed upon by the Holy Spirit because between his failure and between that moment in the boat, he had met Jesus in that closed room when he came through the wall. And Jesus had embraced this man and had breathed on him, touched him, and the Holy Spirit was in him, the Scripture says. The Holy Spirit was breathed into him. But you see, there's another issue. With Christ, it was not enough. That Peter now was restored, safe. It's not enough that he, they give themselves in the upper room. He sees what was going to Paul. It's not going to be enough for that upper room experience. It's not going to be enough that, that they wait on the Lord and minister and are uh, given avidly to the word of God. He said there's another issue. There's another matter, this matter of neglect. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Jesus said, come and dine in there, dining with Jesus. And he looks at, at Peter, remember, and he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes. He said, do you love me more than these? Now, it can't be the disciples he's talking about, because if he says, yeah, I love you more than you, then he's back to the old Peter. He's back to the old pride. It had, had to be. Uh, do you mean... Do I mean more to you than anything else in life, your career, and everything else? Uh, am I really all in all to you? If that's so. And he didn't tell him, go fast and pray. He took it for granted. He took it, 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 it is to say, well, he has my heart now and I have his heart. He's going to pray. He's going to fast. He's going to do these things because that's what a devoted Christian does. That's where he, he knows his life comes from. But there's another issue. It's matter. Scripture says, how do we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? He says, feed my sheep. Peter, I want you to forget your failure. I want you to forget that you denied me. I want you to forget that you had drifted away from me. You have come back to me now. You have my heart and I have your heart. And I, 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 I'm saying it again. Feed my sheep. Don't focus on yourself. Don't focus on your past. Don't focus on your failure. Don't focus on that now. Get your eyes off of your own problems and now look at my sheep. Look at the needs around you. Look at the suffering around you. This is the issue today. 
I can shut myself in my secret closet. I can become a man who prays eight hours a day. I can read the rest of another eight hours in the Bible. I could fast for days, 21, 40 days, whatever it is. I could fast and still neglect this great salvation if I am shut off from human need, if I don't see the hurts and the pains of the body of Christ, and I do nothing about it. I'm a hermit crab. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And Peter got the message like Solomon. I, I saw it and I saw the consequences and I learned from it. And Peter learned three times, feed my sheep. You see, Peter goes up later to the, with John to the temple to pray. And he passes a man who who is a cripple asking for alms. Now, folks, I, I surmise, and I believe this to be true, that Peter had seen that man many times. They went up to the temple. They were there when Jesus drove out the money changers. It, you remember Paul later goes up to the temple. Uh, they went up to the temple to pray and to witness. And they went through the gate beautiful, and they'd seen this man before, but Peter never really saw him. He saw him, but he didn't see him. He didn't see him in the light of this feed my sheep, this neglecting of human need. But this time he comes upon the man and the Bible said he fastened his eyes on him. You see, when you have your eyes on your own problem, when you're thinking only of your own financial needs, your own pain, you lose your vision. You see, but you don't see. It's like that fish that have eyes that can't see, having eyes they can't see. But you see, the need is always there. It's always in our pathway. It's always there, but we can't see it. You don't have to go to China. You don't have to go to India. All around us are human needs, and we're blind to them because we're focused on our own problems. We're focused on our own pain. I speak from experience. I'm preaching to my own heart. Listen, body of Jesus Christ, the first thing that suffers when you, you think nothing about your own problem and you're not casting it upon the Lord and moving on in your pain. I think I've done more for God's glory in my pain than I did without my pain. It's true of everyone in this house. But now Paul fastens his eyes on that man. He's not letting go. And the Bible said he took him by the hand and raised him up. He's feeding the sheep. He's not neglecting it this time. No, I have to do something about it. Folks, the moment you get that mindset of the Holy Spirit, you begin to pray, oh, God, open my eyes. Lord, take my eyes off of my own problem. I don't want to neglect the salvation of Christ to those around me, my family and those that are in pain. Show me the need. And, folks, when you begin to pray that and believe the Holy Spirit for it, What a wonderful thing happens. He begins to show you things right at your doorstep. He begins to show you needs all around you, and then the Lord starts bringing them into your attention. He gives you back your discernment. He opens your eyes, and you become, you begin, become strong in the Lord. And I make you a promise. You begin to get your eyes off of your own problem. Commit those things to the Lord. Rest in them and say, Lord, now help me to be a feeder of the sheep Open my eyes to the needs around me and give me the words and give me the faith. That kind of Christian is never going to drift. Never. That's the guard. That's the wall. That's the protection. Giving out to others. Just giving yourself. These are the most giving pastors and elders I have ever met anywhere in the world. Giving. They're not hirelings. They're here to give. And that's why you hear the word that you hear, the blessing you see on their lives, because they're feeding the sheep, meeting human need. Will you stand?
Honestly, many of you probably didn't need this message. Maybe the majority of you didn't need this message. I needed it. But I, I hopefully have preached it in love and mercy. Not suggesting that this church drifts. This church is not drifting. This church is focused. It's got a, the focus of the Holy Spirit. This church is meeting human need. But, oh, God, help us as individuals, not only as a body, but as individuals, to say, Jesus, use me. We've got a, three days of fasting and prayer. That's the work and call of the Holy Spirit. That wasn't done just in a committee meeting. That was done because God laid it on the hearts of the pastors. And it's call. And folks, there has to be a purpose to it. Out of it has to come a new burden for lost souls. And that hunger for the word and the addiction to this word of God should ultimately produce in me and in you a new, fresh burden for the lost. That's what I'm crying for and praying that my last days would be mightily used to win the lost. That I won't just curl up in this Bible and not see the need. But when I open this, I'll let the Holy Spirit show me what he's saying about feeding. Lord, thank you for your presence this morning. Lord, thank you that you will be here all day speaking from this pulpit, speaking the word. But, Lord, let us take this to heart. Every one of us say, I will have my own experience. I'm not going to give up the battle. I'm I'm not going to just depend on what happens in this auditorium. But I'm going to seek God at my own and ask him to open my eyes. Lord, make us soul winners. Make this one of the greatest soul winning churches in America. Make it one of the greatest soul winning churches so that everyone in this house can say, I I have reached somebody. I I have not been thinking and talking about my own problems. Now, I turn that all over to Jesus. Folks, I'm not going to preach my sermon over. I just want to give you an invitation to if, if, if God has spoken to you in any way. You said, Pastor David, I, I need, I need fresh fire. I need a fresh anointing. I, I, I don't know if you've discouraged. Maybe you haven't given up, but you, you, you've come to a place where the enemy has, you've just opened up your mind to a lot of doubts, and a lot of fear. And you want God to just encapsulate your mind, so to speak, and, and, Put you back in the spiritual warfare. You can come and I'll pray for you and we'll believe the Lord to touch you in a fresh way. God bless you. In the annex, if you just move in between the screens, you can move forward and stand between the screens and I'll pray for you. And the church will pray for you and we'll believe the Lord to do a fresh work in your heart this morning. While they sing, you can gather. The Apostle Paul said, Examine yourselves. Will you be in the faith? Prove yourselves. No, you're not your own selves, how the Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. He's not accusing being reprobates at all. He's saying, you know your heart. He said, just examine it. You know it. You know that Christ lives in you. You know that Christ does not matter to you. You know that Christ is alive in you. Now, folks, I, I, I preach about the law of nature, illustrating the law of the Spirit. But you see, we as few free moral agents... We cannot produce the resources. We cannot produce the water. That's the word. We cannot produce the sun. That's God's part. Our part is to open up. Just open up. He said, I will keep you. I'm I'm reading from Psalm 121. Lift up your eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He that keeps you will not slumber. He that keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is thy shade from the right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He will preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out, your coming in from this time forth, even forevermore. Do you believe that? 
I will keep you. I will preserve you. And I'll make you fruitful, is what Jesus said. I'll make you fruitful. Accept the love of Christ. Accept his loving tap on your shoulder. And he said, just one thing, by the way, remember this. You need my resources. Don't neglect going to the source. Don't neglect that. And don't think that just being saved is enough. Just being safe is not enough. Can you remember that? Being safe is not enough. Being fruitful. Safe and fruitful. Bearing fruit. That's the feeding of the sheep. Can I pray for you? Lord, we thank you for these that have come. I promise to pray for them. We do right now in faith. And those in the annex gathered between the screens. Holy Spirit, thank you that we can live without fear. We don't have to doubt the day that we're going to stand before you. But, Lord, we want to stand before you bringing with our sheaves with us, bringing our fruit to lay at your feet. Lord Jesus, by an act of faith, we turn over every care. You said, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Lord, by an act of faith right now, let us cast, just throw it at your feet and say, here are my financial problems. Here is my relationship problem. Here is my marriage problem. Here, here is my pain. Lord, take it. Lord, I'm going to trust you. You promised to preserve me and keep me, keep my feet from falling. And Lord, we're going to stand on that promise now and believe you and accept it. Raise your hands and begin to thank Jesus for his promise to keep you from falling, present you faultless before the throne of God. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.